so blessed to be with you all today. I met my husband Guy here, some of my best friends here, and Pastor Judd and Lori Wilhite have been our dear friends for over a decade, so it is always so cool when we get to be with our people. Today, I wanna talk about how you can know who you really are and live the life you've been created to live. I've tried to figure this out most of my life. I remember in junior high, that was the time when kids started showing up to school wearing cool brands. And I thought, how do you know what the cool brands are? Like, how do I figure that out? What stores do I go to? I so badly wanted to be cool and loved and accepted. I always felt like I didn't fit in. So I had to figure out what the cool brands were. Well, I grew up in the hood, like the hood hood of San Francisco. And I remember there was a time when there was a new store in town and everyone was saying, man, when this new store comes, let me tell you, it is fancy. It is bougie. And I thought, whatever that store is, I'm gonna wear all the clothes from that store and I'm gonna be cool. I want you to think to yourself what you think that store might have been. The day came, the store was in our neighborhood, it was opening day, I got in line, the doors opened, I thought, any clothes they have, I'm gonna buy. And the store was Jamba Juice. <laughs> Anyone a fan? The smoothie sensation had just made its way onto the scene and into our hearts. And forget the fact that it's not a clothing brand. I saw that they had merch, and I thought, if I just wear those clothes, I'm probably gonna be cool. And there was a girl who went to our church who worked at the Jamba Juice, and she hooked your girl up with a Jamba Juice t-shirt and a Jamba Juice baseball cap and a Jamba Juice tote bag. And I figured, I have to wear all of this together because cool people match. <laughs> I wore that outfit one day a week to school for a month and a half until one day my dad said to me, Hosanna, is it career day again? <laughs> and then I knew. I had to retire the jersey. I didn't wear that outfit ever again. I spent so much of my life trying to change who I was to be loved or to be accepted. I believed most of my life that I was not enough. My dad battled a heroin addiction for 15 years. I always felt like my family was not enough. We had an outdoor outreach to people living without homes and battling with addictions three days a week, and I always felt like my church wasn't enough. I felt like my background wasn't enough. My heritage wasn't enough. I was always trying to find validation from other people. In fact, when I was 18 years old, my dad got cancer and passed away, and I started trying to find who I was and my identity and my worth and the men that I dated and what people thought of me, constantly believing that I was not enough, so I was living like I wasn't enough. Here's the truth for all of our lives. What you believe about yourself determines how you live. So if you believe that you are not enough, you will start living like you're not enough. You might wanna change who you are in order to be accepted or loved. You might obsess about what other people say about you or what other people think about you. You might start thinking that if you work more or try harder or overextend yourself, then you will be more valuable. If you believe that you are a burden to be loved, you will start living like you are. You might start to isolate yourself, thinking if people knew the real you, they would probably leave you thinking that if I got real with anybody about what I'm really going through, they'd probably be annoyed by me. Thinking that when I have big dreams, I don't wanna tell anybody or ask for help. Or if I have prayers, I don't wanna tell anybody about them because I've decided I am a burden to be loved. If you believe that you're a failure, then you will live like you are. You'll think that anything you put your hands to will fail. You'll think that you'll always make the same mistakes that you once did. So you don't wanna start anything or try anything or risk anything. Sometimes you don't even wanna obey God because you've decided anything you try to do will fail. And here's the truth. The enemy of your soul hopes that you believe every one of these lies. He hopes that you answer to lesser names so that you live lesser lives because the enemy knows who you really are. He knows how valuable your life is and how important your choices are. So he's on this whole mission to make sure you don't find out too because he knows if you discovered that you were loved by God, 
chosen by God, created with a purpose and safe in the hands of God, then you would start living like you are. It turns out that children of God, knowing who we really are and living the lives we've been created to live is the enemy's greatest threats. I don't know what lies you have been told in your life, but if you have ever struggled with knowing who you are and struggled with knowing how to live, you're not crazy. You've been told lies your whole life. I came here today to tell someone, you are more than you've been told. And God knew that we would be told lies our whole lives. God knew that we would start to see ourselves through the broken lens of other people. And that if we believed these lies, we would get stuck in the wrong patterns of thinking and then we would get stuck in the wrong patterns of living. So God sent a solution. He sent his son Jesus to come and be with us, to share in our human experience, to die for us, forgive us, heal us, and make us whole, and then show us who we really are and how to live the lives we've been created to live. I wanna unpack for you a story that I grew up reading and I grew up hearing about, but it wasn't until this past season of my life when I saw something in it that I used to miss. We're gonna put the scripture up on the screens and when we get to the red words, I want you to say it out loud with me. Matthew 4, 18, 20. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. This is what I used to miss. The place those boys were at in their lives when Jesus came to them and said, come and follow me, is a place that I have found myself at time and time again. And it might be a place you found yourself today as well. To unpack the significance of this story and what it meant to those boys, we're gonna go back to school really quick. I wanna unpack for you the first century Jewish educational system. So we're gonna go back to school really quick. And if you've never had a Chinese teacher before, let me tell you, A pluses only. Okay, here we go. There were three levels of schooling in the first century Jewish educational system. Three levels. Level one, students were around ages six to 10 and they had to learn the Hebrew scriptures, memorize the first five books of the Bible, what was written at that time. And if you're thinking, that's insane, not everyone can do that. You're right, not everyone could do that. Not everyone would be able to move on to the next level of schooling but the best of the best could, and they would move on to level two. Level two is ages about 10 to 14, 10 to 15, and here they would memorize the rest of the scriptures as well as learn some critical thinking skills, how to analyze the scriptures, how to apply the scriptures, how to answer questions and maybe ask questions back. Not everyone was able to do this. Not everyone was good enough but the best of the best were. And they moved on to level three. And this was a whole other level of schooling. They would go to a teacher or a rabbi and they had to audition for the teacher to prove that they were good enough. Imagine Yale or Harvard admissions times 10. And the teacher would grill the student to see how much scripture they had memorized. How fast were their critical thinking skills? Could they process more than the other people in their class? They were trying to see how good the student was and if the student was worthy to learn under the teacher. And if the student was good enough, if the teacher thought that kid, their parents paid for the right kind of tutor, that kid had a community that loved them and supported them and helped them study. That kid can process faster than the other kids. That student is good enough. Then historically, 
the teacher would look to the student and say, come and follow me. And students long to hear those words because this is what it literally meant. Now they were gonna go and follow this teacher and follow their lifestyle. They were going to follow their life and learn how they did life. They were gonna learn how they planned their weeks. How did they plan their rhythms? How did they have relationships? How did they have boundaries? What was their philosophy? What was their theology? They would follow a teacher to learn who they were and also how to live. But if the student was not good enough, if the teacher saw the student and thought their parents didn't have enough money to buy the best kind of tutor, they didn't have a community that understood them, loved them, supported them, and helped them study. That student is smart, but not the very specific kind of smart that I'm looking for. If the teacher thought the student was not good enough, the teacher would say, go home and ply your trade. Which meant, go back to your family business. Go back and do what your daddy does, because you're not good enough to be my student. This changes this story a little bit when we realize that Jesus was not sitting behind an admissions desk and he was not sitting behind an American Idol judge's desk trying to see who could perform the best or sing the highest note, but Jesus went to where those boys were and they were sitting in their boats holding their nets because they were fishermen. Why were they fishermen? Because they had already been told they were not good enough to do anything else. They had already auditioned and had been told they were failures. They had already done all that they could and were told that they would not make the mark. And when Jesus met them, they were in a place of disappointment, a place of defeat. Their life had not turned out the way that they hoped. The things they wanted to achieve were out of their grasp. And as Jesus walked to where they were, he was calling them to do three things that he's calling each and every one of us to do today as well. And the first thing he was calling them to do was drop the old name. As these boys were holding on to their nets, they were holding on to a symbol of disappointment a story of why they would never be good enough and never make the mark. They were, had answered to names like not enough, failure, not good enough. And as Jesus was meeting them where they were, he was calling them out of a mindset of defeat, a mentality of defeat, and was saying, drop the story that you've held on to your whole life about why you'll never be good enough. Drop the story that somebody told you, that you accepted and you've repeated of why your life will never have purpose. Jesus was saying, you may have been told that you're not enough, that your life is not as important as other people's lives, that you'll never make the mark. You may have been told that you have to do more or hustle harder or overextend yourself to prove your value, but Jesus wanted them to know the same thing he wants us to know too. You are more than you've been told. Perhaps nobody told you this, but you are valuable. Perhaps nobody told you this, but your life is important. Perhaps nobody told you this, but you don't have to stay stuck in your past. You can live a life that is healed and whole and filled with purpose. Come and follow me, and I'm gonna show you the truth of who you really are. Jesus was saying, drop the old name that you've allowed to be a ceiling over your life because you've accepted a definition from people who have no right to define you. He said, drop the old name, and then he said, come and follow me. Come and follow me for real. Drop the old name and follow Jesus for real. What does this look like practically? Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus before, and today is the day you wanna give your life to him. And then your next question might be, how do I follow him practically? What's the next steps that I take? Or maybe you're here today and you've given your life to Jesus decades ago, but perhaps recently you have felt a little disconnected, a little disconnected from God, a little disconnected from living out your purpose, maybe a little disconnected from yourself. 
and you're wondering, am I following Jesus for real? Am I living the life he's created me to live? How can we follow Jesus practically in our real everyday lives? You know, two nights ago, my husband, Guy, and I had a very big moment in our marriage. We went to our very first Cirque de Soleil show. Oh my goodness, it was amazing. We met here at Central. We've had so many great dates in Central, but we've never been to a Cirque show. And I was just amazed. All the amazing ways they can move their bodies. It was so cool. I understand that I'm in a room of people who live in Las Vegas. And you're like, girl, we've been knowing about Cirque. Okay, where you been? It's like if you came to my hometown and you were like, Hosanna, have you heard of the Golden Gate Bridge? And I'm like, yes, I've heard of it. I get it. But I am still processing the wonders of this Cirque show. And maybe it was ignorance, or maybe it was pure bliss. But after the show, I looked to my husband, Guy, and I said, I want to do that. <laughs> I said, do you think I could do that? And because he wants a happy life, he wants a happy wife. And so he said, yes, my love, I believe you could do that. <laughs> and I said, do you think do you think I could do that right now? And he said, no. <laughs> and he said, you would have to train. You would have to practice. He said, they were not able to do that because they tried really hard in a moment. No, they were able to do that because they have a lifestyle preparing them for that moment. He said the only reason they can do that in public is because of the life they live in private. The same is true when we want to follow Jesus. We say we want to live like Jesus. We want to do what Jesus would do. But Jesus does not expect us to give our lives to him and then all of a sudden know what he would do every single moment in every single situation. No, Jesus said, come and follow me and come learn my rhythms. Come and follow me and learn my patterns. They're different from the patterns you used to live in. Come and follow me and see my lifestyle. See how I live. You're gonna come and follow me so you naturally start to live as I live and you naturally start to live the life you've been created to live as well. Jesus, when he had his apprentices, his disciples, his students, he was showing them his lifestyle his rhythms, and throughout the New Testament, throughout the Bible, you will see the rhythms of Jesus that he calls us to live out as well. To follow Jesus is to literally follow the way that he lived. I wanna highlight four rhythms of Jesus for you today. There's many rhythms, but here are four that Jesus' apprentices would have followed and ones that we can follow as well today. Four rhythms of Jesus. The first one, is engaging in God's word. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna read through every passage, but write down these passages or take a photo of the screen and you can read it later. There's a story of Jesus on a road trip with his family and he leaves the path everyone is on to go into a temple and read the scrolls. Read what was written of the word of God at that time to know who he was. Jesus demonstrates to us a rhythm of going out of your way to engage in God's words. Not just to read the Bible, but to think on what the word of God says and to apply it into your life. Engage in God's words. The second rhythm that Jesus would have taught was a rhythm of prayer. Jesus, like all of us, had a lot of responsibilities, important ones. Family responsibilities, relationship responsibilities, ministry responsibilities. But Jesus made it a rhythm, a habit, to go out of his way to find time to be alone with God to pray so that he was not dictated by the opinions of people, but that it was God who was guiding his steps. The third rhythm of Jesus is a rhythm of rest. I couldn't pick one, so there's four. But take a photo, read them all. Jesus was showing them a rhythm of going out of their way weekly to stop working, stop getting ahead, and to rest because he knew that some of us have lived in a pattern of trying to prove our worth by how much we can do and how much we can work and how much we can achieve. So Jesus gave us a rhythm 
that would counteract the pattern we used to live in so that you and I could discover that we are already loved before we do one thing. The fourth rhythm of Jesus is a rhythm of being in real community. Again, there's four. Jesus made it a habit to live out a life of confession, getting real with the people around him about what he was really going through, and a rhythm of celebration, celebrating what God was already doing. And hey, we're doing that today. Today, we are practicing the rhythm of real community that Jesus showed us to. Some of us are not at church today because we felt like it. Some of us had a really hard week. Some of us are not here today because it was convenient. Some of us drove quite a ways to be here. But some of us are here because we have committed to living like Jesus. We have a rhythm, a habit, so that we know who we are despite what we're feeling. We're getting our identity from something more stable than how we're feeling that day. We wanna be around other people who wanna know God for real. Jesus demonstrated these rhythms to us because he knew that in order to live the life we say we wanna live in public, it meant changing the way we were living in private. He was showing us a fresh way to live. For many of us, the fight for our life, if you have ever felt disconnected from God or disconnected from yourself, the fight for your life might look like fighting for your schedule. Looking at your month and thinking, how in my real life am I gonna plan to follow Jesus, follow the lifestyle and rhythms of Jesus for real? Because you will know who you really are when you spend real time with the one who knows you the best. <laughs> Jesus said, drop the old name, follow me for real. And then Jesus said, now I'm gonna make you fishers of men. I'm gonna make you fishers of people. And when I grew up, I grew up believing that that meant now we're gonna go and catch people. Now we're gonna go and get more people to follow Jesus. Now we're gonna partner with God on his mission so that every person alive can know how loved they are and they can all be reconnected with God. And it does mean that. And also, as Jesus was saying, I'm gonna make you fishers of men, Jesus was pointing out who he wanted to use and what he was going to use to do it. And Jesus was saying, I wanna use the thing that people used to point at to tell you you're disqualified. He was saying, I wanna use the thing that you used to point at as a symbol of why you're a little different. Jesus was saying, I wanna use the thing that other people used to point at to tell you you're out. That's what we're gonna use to show more people that they're in. Jesus was saying, people tore you down because you're just a fisherman. I am saying, thank God you're a fisherman. I've been looking for a fisherman. I wanna use what being a fisherman has taught you. I wanna use what your daddy's trained has taught you. I want to use what your background has taught you. Everything you've been through and everything you have overcome is exactly what I've been looking for. And God is saying the same thing to us today. God is saying, I want to use the resilience that came out of that one season that you thought you wouldn't survive, but you did. God is saying, I want to use the character that came out of that one season when you had integrity, when nobody else was looking. God is saying, I wanna use the humility that came out of that one season when nothing went the way you wanted, but you surrendered to God and you trusted God and you relied on God's power and not your own. God is saying, everything the enemy wanted to use to harm you, I wanna use for good. God is saying, I wanna use your real story and your real background. Yes, even the messy parts where I had to rescue you, because that's what we're gonna use to show more people how I can rescue them too. Jesus said, drop the old name, follow me for real, and then answer to a new name. Answer to who you really are. Before we close out this service, 
is it okay if I share a spoken word poem with you? Would that be okay? I'm gonna invite the band up. And I learned spoken word poetry on the streets of San Francisco. All my friends living without homes and battling with addiction didn't. And I wanted to share this spoken word piece with our central family today because it came out of a season of defeat. It came out of a season that wasn't too different from the place those boys were at, at their boats, holding their nets. It was the most painful season I've ever lived through, probably one of the hardest seasons of our marriage. We had loss after loss, immense loss financially, physically, relationally, the people who I thought would stay didn't. And the people who I thought would defend me didn't. And I lost who I was. And Pastor Judd and Lori Wilhite walked us through that season. And without that community, I don't know where we would be. And I had to fight for my life by fighting for my schedule. I had grown so disconnected from God. I had to drop the old name. I was answering to names like guilty, shameful, failure. And then I had to follow Jesus for real. I looked at my calendar and I had to fight to spend time in prayer, to confess to God what I was really going through and ask him to direct my steps. I had to fight to find time to rest, to have days that I wasn't getting ahead or producing, knowing I was already loved without doing one thing. I had to fight for time in real community, trying to stretch myself socially and get real with people about what I was really going through, trying to go to events to celebrate with people. And then I had to fight for time in God's word to know what God really said about me. And then I started memorizing names that God called me trying to make his voice the loudest voice in my life. You may have been told you're unloved or unwanted or unworthy, but God has some other names for you. And when you know what the word of God says about you, you know what the creator of the universe thinks about you. And then when you know who you are, it changes how you live. And as I fought for real time with God, I started to get my life back. And I wanna tell you today something I wish I would have known years ago. You deserve to stop seeing yourself through the broken lens of other people. When you start seeing yourself through the lens of God, you will discover who you really are and who you've always been. And when you know who you are, it changes how you live. I wanna share with you the spoken word piece that came out of that season. It's also a sneak preview about what you would discover about yourself when you fight to spend time with the one who knows you the best. Thank you for letting me share this spoken word poem with you. This is called, I Have a New Name. God spends a lot of time in the Bible telling us who we are. It's almost as if he knew that we would doubt who that was from time to time. It's as if he saw it coming, that we'd spend our whole lives searching for what our identity, what our real name was, and that there'd be many moments in our lives where we'd let different kinds of names define us when we've looked in the mirror, compared ourselves to pictures and heard the name ugly, when we've been left by loved ones, people we trusted once and heard the name unworthy, when we've been drowning in discouragement, living in a seemingly never ending crisis and heard the name forgotten, when we've had our hopes up and our hearts open only to be brought down by closed doors and we've heard rejected when we've looked for infinite affirming love through lesser physical fleshly versions when we gave it away 
or when it was stolen and we heard impure, we heard garbage. When we go to other vices to ease our pain and we hear addict, we hear forever broken. When we feel like we're living in the shadow of someone else's calling and we hear second place. When our pain cripples us to a point where we don't even know how to let others in and we hear lonely when our past seems too gross for others to forgive and we hear disgusting, it's overwhelming. These voices we're constantly hearing, it's suffocating. This air of constant critique and comparing and it's sort of amazing the people whose voices I've allowed to name me the power I've given to my past, to my mirror, and to my surroundings, and enabled them to identify me. The amount of years I've spent living up to whatever others say about me. But God says something else about me. It's like he knew there would be other voices. So he wrote his voice down in a timeless book of truths that would remind us over and over again in the moments when lies would block his truths and somehow make us forget. So I'm going back to the source, not the people I've allowed to represent God to me, but the actual literal tangible words that he has written down for me and theirs some other names he's given to me. John 15, 15, he calls me friend. First Thessalonians 1, 4, he calls me chosen. Ephesians 2, 10, he calls me his masterpiece. He calls me his art. He calls me handmade. He calls me purposed and fashioned for good things. First Corinthians 6, 19, he calls my body a temple. He calls it the residence of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8, he calls me his messenger to the world. Galatians 3.26, he calls me his child. Romans 5.8, he calls me greatly loved. John 8.36, he calls me free, free indeed. 2 Corinthians 5.17, he calls me brand new. And it's amazing how different these names are from the names I'm used to listening to. And in my journey to discover who I really am, in my battle to uncover the truths of myself, I've learned something new about my name. And now this is what I am certain of. My name is not the name the world calls me. My name is not the name my past calls me. My name is not even the name my own mirror calls me, but my name, my name is the name I choose to answer to. And I can choose today from this moment forward to answer to a new name. When I hear lonely, that's not me. When I hear disgusting, that's not me. When I hear unworthy, I don't even look over my shoulder. When I hear broken, they must have confused me. Please look elsewhere. When I hear ugly, abandoned, useless, forgotten, I figure someone just has to remind them. Maybe those were my old names, but they're no longer the names that I will respond to. My name is the name I have chosen to spend my days living up to. And if these other voices are not saying the same thing that the truth is, I look in my mirror and I repeat this. They have no right to be speaking to you. When you stop answering to your old names, they will stop having power over you. The names that my father, eternity's author, the world's creator has called me are the only names that I answer to. So when I hear friend of God, that's my name. Chosen, that's my name. Loved, wanted, created with a purpose, that's my name. God's masterpiece, that's my name. God's messenger, that's my name. Child of God, you must be looking for me. Greatly loved, you must be calling for me. Brand new, that is my name. So that is a name that I will respond to because the enemy has no power here. 
perfect love cast out all fear and perfect love has named me and you. So what is your new name? What is stirring up inside of you when you hear these words that His word, that the word has proclaimed? What do you know is the name God is calling you? Maybe it's not the name you grew up with. Maybe it's not the name your old friends associate you with. Maybe it's not the name that your whole life you were used to identifying with, but it's the name you now answer to. So when the enemy tries to get to you, it's just the name you introduce yourself with. As for me, my name is forgiven. My name is free. My name is brand new, loved, wanted, child of God, created with a purpose. And it's been a pleasure to meet you. Thank you, Central family. You may be seated. I came here today to tell you, you are more than you've been told. And when you know who you are, it changes how you live. And today, before we close out this service, I wanna give you an opportunity to answer to a new name. We put all nine names from the spoken word piece from the word of God up on the screens. You are all of these names from the word of God. God calls you all of these names. But I think sometimes there's a specific lie that you need to speak a specific truth to. So today I wanna give you that opportunity to answer to who you really are. In a second, I'm going to say all nine of these names again. And when you hear the name that you wanna answer to, the name that is stirring up inside of you, when you hear that name in that moment, I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet and stay standing as your brothers and sisters stand with you and join in as they answer to their new names. And if you got to answer to a couple of new names, that's cool. You raise your hand, you agree to every name that you're answering to today. Wherever you are at all of our locations and everyone watching online, I invite you to, to stand to your new name when you hear the new name. Not because it makes it more spiritual, but because it makes it more real for us. I'm answering to a new name today. So if you are here and you want to answer to John 15, 15, he calls you his friend. Wherever you are, would you just stand to your feet and stay standing? I see you, sir, in the back. Nice to meet you, friend. Nice to meet you, friend. I see you, friend. Stand to your feet if you're answering to friend. If you're answering to friend, you're saying, I'm not alone. I'm not abandoned. Your friend is your homie, your ride or die through thick and thin. You're saying no matter who else left, no matter who else is not here, God says I am his friend. Stay standing, friend. I'm gonna call up the chosen. Who here needs to stand and answer to 1 Thessalonians 1, 4? He calls you chosen. I see like a chosen section here. I see you family on this side right here. When you are chosen, you are who you are, where you are, because the creator of the universe said it was important that you were here. Who here needs to answer to Ephesians 2? 10 he calls you his masterpiece who here will stand and say every detail of my life was handmade by the creator of the universe and God does not make any mistakes you are no knockoff brand you are bougie you are designer made everything about you God thought was important for this moment in time who here needs to answer to 1 Corinthians 6 19 he calls your body a temple who here needs to stand raise your hand and say my body is a temple where the Holy Spirit lives I don't know who touched you I don't know what was said about you behind closed doors but I know as a fellow temple we have power and authority from the Word of God to look in the mirror every day and say man I already look good today because the Holy Spirit lives inside of me and man can't take away what God has put inside who here needs to answer to Acts 1 8 he calls you his messenger to the world can I see some people stand and raise your hands and say I'm going to share my story like someone else's story depends on it I'm going to share about Jesus in my real everyday life free indeed who here needs to answer John 8 36 he calls you free indeed free from my old ways free from my old mistakes free from my old mentalities I want to live in a fresh new way I am free indeed who here needs to answer to brand new second Corinthians 5 17 I'm a new person with a new focus with a new purpose I am brand new who needs to answer Romans 5 8 he calls you greatly loved 
Maybe other people didn't love you the way they should have loved you. But God says, I chose you even before you chose me. You are already greatly loved. And finally, the name that encapsulates all the names, Galatians 3.26, he calls you his child. Who here needs to stand and raise your hand and say, I'm a child of God. I'm gonna fight for my life by fighting for my schedule. I'm gonna rest in God's presence. I'm gonna know I'm loved without doing one thing. Before we close out this service and sing this song, I wanna invite you today, if you've never given your life to Jesus before, to give your life to Him today. In a second, if you know that today's the day you wanna make that decision, in a second, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. And after you raise your hand, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer to give your life to Jesus. And here's what we're gonna do. Everyone else in the room who has already given your life to Jesus, we're gonna add on to their faith and we're gonna say that prayer out loud with them together today. So if you are here today and you're saying, I'm giving my life to Jesus, I wanna follow Jesus for real, on the count of three, would you just shoot your hand up in the air? One, two, three, hands up in the air if you're saying, I'm giving my life to Jesus today. I see you, sir. I see you, family. Keep your hands up, I see you. Keep your hands up in the air. Keep your hands up and then you're gonna repeat after me. And everyone who's already made the decision to give your life to Jesus, say it out loud with us, okay? Say it out loud. Say, Jesus, I give my life to you. I believe you died and rose again. I drop my old names. I turn away from my sins. I wanna follow you for real and live the life you've created me to live. In the name of Jesus, and everyone says together, amen and amen.